coming up next on Prime. Insight from St. Patrick's Day from a true Irishman. Everyone celebrates this holiday differently, but how do they do things in Ireland? Prime starts now. Falcha, and happy St. Patrick's Day. I'm Catherine Hunter, and welcome to Prime. We're here today with a real Irishman, Sean Gunnell of Mahan Gunnell International Consulting. We'll find out how they celebrate St. Patrick's Day in Ireland and what Sean's doing now in Dallas. Welcome. Cade Mila Falcha, and welcome to Ireland in Dallas. So how do you celebrate St. Patrick's Day in Ireland? Well, we start off with a Guinness, of course. But you must remember that St. Patrick's Day, as the patron saint of Ireland, is a holy day. It's a holy day of obligation for us Catholics, which until recently meant that all the pubs were closed. Can you believe it? <laughs> so for us, it starts off with mass in the morning and then a solemn day of fasting and no alcohol. Fortunately, this all changed about 10, 15 years ago, and we have now made it into an Irish festival, just like you would have here in America. That sounds like great fun. Are there any special foods that you serve on St. Patrick's Day? Well, it calls into play what we have in rural Ireland all the time. The style of cooking in Ireland is what the Italians and, and America are real popular now, the slow cooking movement, where everything is braised. We put everything in a pot, let it sit over the fire, and it's available all day long for guests and family members to come in, and there's always something delicious sitting, waiting for them. So this food on the table looks great. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, exactly. This is one of the most popular items in Ireland, of course, and well known here, Irish stew, which uh, here is often made with beef. At home in Ireland, we make it with lamb. And it's a, it's a dish which braises over low heat for a long time. It can sit in the pot all day, and like I said, you can come in and grab a scoop anytime you want. We serve it here with another popular item, which is Irish soda bread, which you can get here at certain bakeries and is very simple to make at home. And the soda bread goes, with, goes perfectly with the Irish stew. And this other dish, I'm not familiar with that. This is a dish from Ireland called Col Cannon. You know that we're very fond of our potatoes in Ireland and of we think of umpteen ways to make dishes. This is a dish where you take mashed potatoes and you blend it through with cabbage or green onion. I like the green onion, it gives a little bit more bite to it. Make a little well in the middle and put a dab of butter in it, always helps. Now I love Guinness, but you brought some wines. Yeah, you can often, you know, people don't think of wine with Irish food so much, but I enjoy, because you've got some full-bodied dishes here, I enjoy a full-bodied wine with it. And we brought here a little Bordeaux to go along with it, and of course a white wine would be fine too. But yes, of course Guinness is the most popular thing in Ireland, and that goes with, with anything in Ireland. So tell me, can we get the recipes for these dishes somewhere? Yes, I have them on our website, which is mahangunnel.com, and we'll have a little shot of that later on in the show for you. But we have our recipes and many other things that we'll be talking about today. Great. So I was in Ireland recently, and they serve an enormous meal for breakfast. Oh, absolutely. You've got to understand that the basic thought in Ireland is that you're dealing with an agrarian farming community, and so these men start the day with a heavy, large breakfast. Bacon, sausage, eggs, you often have a grilled mushroom, grilled tomato, black pudding, white pudding, potato bread, soda bread, gallons and gallons of tea. These guys are going out and they're working six or seven hours until lunchtime uh, in the fields, and so they're not leaving with a cappuccino and a croissant. They need a full meal to support them for the whole part of the day. And then for lunch and dinner, they eat the same type? Right. We don't have lunch as it is over here. We call lunch dinner, which would be tough for tourists when they're in Ireland because somebody around 11 o'clock will say they're going for their dinner and you, everyone gets confused. But we have a big meal at noontime, noon, 1 o'clock, which would be typical to a dinner in America. But we're talking about soups, main courses, potatoes, breads, all these kind of things because, again, the farmer is working from that time till 6, 7, 8 o'clock at night literally till when the cows come home. And when the cows do come home at night time is when we have tea, or te, as we say in Ireland. And again, unlike the British on their cucumber sandwiches, we have a nice big sandwich, a smaller portion of what we had at, at dinner time, and so, but we eat very lightly at night. So we kind of have a, a good system in that we start heavier in the day and we're working it off, and at night time ending up with a smaller snack. That makes great sense. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I came to America as soon as I could. I uh, went to school in England, which as an Irish Catholic, 
particularly on St. Patrick's Day, it's good to remind me of how much fun I had doing that. I was educated there and went to college at the London School of Economics. And as soon as I was done with school, I bolted over here and came to New York, like all of us do. I did my boot camp in New York, enjoyed it tremendously, worked on um, Wall Street for Beer Stearns, and worked at night at an Irish pub called Rosie O'Grady's. It's amazing what you can do when you're young. I worked at, at uh, Beer Stearns from 8 until 5, and Rosie O'Grady's from 6 until 4 in the morning, and then <laughs> back all sleep. over again. <laughs> so did you stay in New York? Actually, from I decided when I came over that I'd spend the first few years kind of getting to know the country and doing things as much, doing as much fun things as I could. And one of the things that I always thought about doing was becoming a pilot. So actually, I went after saving up some money. I went from New York to Santa Monica in California and became a pilot out there. Went through my licenses, got my commercial license, and uh, worked at a fancy uh, movie star club at night to pay for my flying lessons. I then fortunately had the opportunity to get into a hotel school in Switzerland, so I went to Lausanne, Switzerland for a year or so to go to school there. And then from Lausanne, how did you get back to the United States? Well, actually, in the hotel school I went to, I was looking at, I was asking their help as to where to go from there, and at that time, in the mid-80s, some of the greatest hotels in the world were be being built right here in Dallas, and many of the managers were from this same hotel school. So with that in mind, I came here to talk to the guys at the hotel with the thought of getting into the hotel business. So did you go into hospitality immediately? Well, when I got here, I saw the tremendous construction boom that was going on at the time, the go-go days in the real estate world here. And I realized that if I ever wanted to do something on my own, I'd need to learn a bit about real estate. So I decided to get into commercial real estate, got my license, and the first project I was involved in was building the Rolex building in the uptown area here in Dallas. And so when did you decide to open a restaurant? Well, I, I was doing the real estate business. I had an, set up an office here, and I set up an office for myself in Phoenix, Arizona, and everything was going along fine until the savings and loan mm -hmm. debacle happened and the, the spigot got turned off. So it was at that point that I realized that I had learned enough about real estate and I had my hospitality background. I thought this would be the time to get into the business, and I built the first restaurant I built was a fast Chinese food operation called Walk and Go. And um, it was in North Dallas on a very tiny piece of property, and it was a drive through only operation. I had um, got the property, incidentally, from Bill Waugh. Bill Waugh was the founder of Taco Bueno, so he had done exactly what I had done, which is to do an ethnic food quickly. So I was very anxious to work with him on it. So with his help, I got the land, we built the building, and we got going. And um, we did quite well, in fact. From that, we got uh, an endorsement and a license from the American Heart Association. And I got a notice in D Magazine um, because of that, almost the cover, uh, talking about how an Irishman got uh, a Chinese operation with the American Heart approval. Good for you. So what, how did you get into Mexican food from Chinese? Well, following the Chinese operation, I was watching, too, how large the Hispanic population is here and growing very, very quickly. And yet many of the uh, many uh, upscale operators are not really looking at that market so much. So I thought there would be an interesting market to try to get into. So I built an operation on Northwest Highway overlooking Bachman Lake. I have a few pictures here of what, taking a small uh, former gas station and turning it into a Cancun style bar, grill, and it, we, in fact, uh, built a beach in front of the property with a sailboat on it so people could act and feel like they were actually in Cancun. Wow, sounds like a great place. It was a ton of fun. So what are you doing that these days? Well, I have moved now from actually operating the restaurants myself to helping others with their operations. So we have Mahangunnel International Consultings, and we say international because I speak five languages. So many of our clients have operations in other parts of the world, and I can be the same guy to help them in Mexico, South America, in Europe, various places that they may have operations. And I understand you've got a very clever tagline. Yes, in fact, it's uh, pro increasing profits with taste. Uh, not only trying to be punny about uh, helping people with with the food quality of their operations, but with the fact that um, many, many times a tasteful adjustment of furniture 
or a tasteful adjustment of decor can bring in a lot of help on the, on the bottom line. Very smart. So what kind of services do you all provide? Well, we have a variety of things that we help clients with from the very beginning with uh, concept development, whether it, and logo design, menu design, even the feasibility of the whole project. We walk through with, with somebody on this. And uh, we come to the table on this as a partner, in the sense of a partner, in that we're looking at what will work and what will just like an owner would. And that's what, we, that's what we like to think of ourselves, helping these guys. So from, from the very beginning, from the concept development, the next step then, of course, would be to help them with real estate and their uh, locations. I guess that makes perfect sense with your background. Yeah, as a commercially licensed real estate broker, um, I'm familiar with some very obscure, and I've had to go through some very obscure formats with some of my restaurants, going before planning and zoning hearings, getting property uh, adjusted accordingly, can be a kind of complex matter and certainly intimidating if you haven't done it before. So we can help in that form. So what about for marketing? Do you help restaurants with marketing? Yeah, for marketing, we, we've, we have access to many PR and advertising firms to help with marketing. But I also look at it from an operations standpoint. Can we add delivery? Can we open for breakfast and broaden the operations end of the business more than just at throwing money at advertising dollars? And I assume daily operations, you can help them tweak yeah, I mean, we, we come in again and want to help an operator. And it's amazing how some simple things can affect an operation. One of the things we do with a normal restaurant, walking in the door, and you can do this when you're at home. You go into a restaurant and you, how many seats are facing you and how many seats are facing away, have their back to you. And it's, you walk in and you get a, your, your attitude automatically changes. By turning a table just 45 degrees, everyone's face is seen when you walk in the door. And so automatically you feel so much more welcome. It's like places that have, some places have a little entertainment, and they will often put it at the far end of the restaurant so that as a guest walks in, everybody who's watching the entertainment is looking the opposite way. Whereas if that entertainment were near the front door, then as the guest walks in, everybody's looking at you. A much more inviting and, and very simple uh, tactic. So do you work only with restaurants? No. In fact, we work a lot with banking uh, institutions, lenders of various sorts, landlords too, because often an operator may get into trouble and the first people that find out about it are him being late with his loan payment or late with his rent. So we come in helping the landlord and helping the operator get the business back on track so that the rent can be paid and the loans can be paid. We often, too, work with home builders. Home builders are great guys building houses, but maybe their kitchen for layouts may not be what they could be, and the restaurant guy can come in and tweak that and help them. And as we all know, a kitchen can be a big deciding point on the purchase of a house. Great. Well, we really appreciate you coming and talking to us today. My pleasure. My pleasure. Here you are. Slauncher. We'll be right back. Good luck.